And but today we're going to resume our series on the book of Revelation. Now, does anyone remember the title of our series? Oh, well, yeah, it's up there. <laughs> All you need to do is just look on the screen. Revelation, what the future holds. And again, today we're going to continue our series on Revelation. So go ahead and open your Bible to the book of Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. And as you are turning there, I'm excited to tell you that we have completed an in-depth study of the first two books of the book of Revelation. How about that? Woohoo! That's, that's incredible. So that means we only have 20 chapters to go or 355 verses to go. So we're almost at the end. Amen? Amen. Unless the Lord returns sooner. But remember, as we, as I, just a recap, remember in chapter 1, we learned about Jesus being the apocalypser, the unveiler or the one who wrote the future or what the future holds. We also learned there about the goodness of and the gloriousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 2, we learn about the first four churches that the Apostle John wrote to as instructed by the Lord Jesus. Now, let's see if we can recall. We learn about the Ephesus church. They were known as the church who left their first love. Remember that? We also learn about the church in Smyrna, the persecuted church. We learn about the church in Pergamum. That's the church that was notorious for listening to false teachers, such as the followers of Balaam and the Nicolaitans. And also, we learned a couple of weeks ago, or three weeks ago, about the church in Thyatira, and how the church was a compromising faith. But today, we're going to look at the fifth church, which is again part of the seven churches that the Apostle John wrote to, and they're all located in the Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. Now, the fifth church is the church in Sardis. Now, the church in Sardis has one title for the Lord Jesus Christ, or rather from the Lord Jesus Christ, and the church in Sardis, according to Jesus, was a dead church. Was a dead church. Let me ask you this. How would you describe a church that is dead versus a church that is alive? Now, you probably would say, well, an alive church would be a church that has a nice building, well-kept grounds, people are coming in droves, they have events and activities for every age, on every level, every time. And you would say that when people are there and bustling and congregating, that's an alive church, right? And of course, you would say a dead church would be the opposite. You know, a run-down building, unkept grounds, it's a small church, only very few people attend that church. They only have very few ministries happening in the church, right? So you would think that's the dead church compared to an alive church. But do you know that according to Jesus, according to Jesus, a church can be alive and yet dead. Come on now. That means a church can be alive but dead. Just as the church in Sardis. See, the church in Sardis was well known. They were bustling with people, programs, and they were popular in the community. And yet Jesus tells them, but you are a dead church. Now what does an alive but dead church look like? And so that begs the question, is Caprock Church a dead church? Well, let's find out as we stand right now in honor of the reading of the Word of God, Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Revelation 3, 1 through 6. And if you have it, say Amen. Amen. Verse 1. To the angel of the church in Sardis write... These are the words of him who hold the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up! Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Obey it and repent. 
But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief. And you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You may be seated. Amen. Now the letter to the church in Sardis has contents similar to the other churches. For instance, here we see that the letter was also addressed to the angel of the church. Look at verse 1. To the angel of the church in Sardis. So we already studied and determined this because in other letters, it was also addressed to the angel of the church. And that pertains to the pastor of the church. But notice here also, it has another description of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every letter has a deity description of the Lord Jesus Christ. It proves that Jesus is God. Here we see the description of Jesus. Look at verse 1. These are the words of Him. That means it came from Christ. He was the apocalypse or unveiler of what is to come. But watch this now. Who holds the seven spirits of God. He holds the seven spirits of God. Now we have to understand this. That the seven spirits there pertains to the Holy Spirit of God. That is another title or name of the Holy Spirit he is the seven spirits of God. We see this in Revelation 1.4. We also see this in Isaiah 11 verse 4. Because there you see, or rather verse 2, because you see there the attributes, the seven attributes of the Holy Spirit. Yes, sir. Now it's quite interesting, however, there's something that we must be aware of here. Because if you read our Bible translation, it says, Who holds the seven spirits of God, you would think that Jesus is holding on the Holy Spirit Come of God. On, man. Come on, man. So it seems like the Holy Spirit is subservient or below the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, it's not true. Hmm. That's why it's important that we look at it from the original language of the New Testament, which is Greek. And this word holds is from the Greek word echo. Say that with me. Echo. And it literally means has. So now a better translation of this is the one who has the seven spirits. So now suddenly the Holy Spirit is equal with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus has the Holy Spirit of God just as you have the Holy Spirit of God. So therefore it shows the equality of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit of God. Same thing when the Lord Jesus said, I and the Father are one. John 10 verse 30, right? It shows the equality of Jesus as a son with God the Father. So that means if you put them together, if you would do a deductive study, you would come up with this. That means that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are all co-equal and co-eternal and they're all one and the same. That means we have one God manifesting himself in three persons and we call that the doctrine of Trinity. And that sets us apart from all other religion. We are the only one who has one God and yet manifesting himself in three persons. And of course, that would be another topic or sermon in and of itself. But also here, Jesus this was described as having, verse 1, who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now, we already saw this in Revelation 1.20, those seven stars that Jesus has, all those were the seven stars or the seven angels or the seven pastors. So that means Jesus is always with his ministers. Yes, sir. Yes, that sir. Jesus is always with his pastor, with his appointed servant or shepherd in the mm -hmm. church. Unless that shepherd becomes a sinful Come shepherd. On, wow, Come what on, a man. blessing to be right. there with the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. But also this letter has Jesus' corrections. Or rebukes. Look at verses 1, 2, and 3. He said, you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. You know, he was correcting them. You are alive, but you are actually dead. Look at verse 2. He tells them, wake up. 
I would love to say that right now too, isn't it? That's an appropriate time for me to say that. Come Wake on. up! Come on, man! Wake up, Cap Rock Church! Yes, sir. You will have plenty of time to take a nap this afternoon. That's right. That's we said, Wake up! Not, not found your deeds complete. He said that. Look at the end of verse 2. Not found your deeds complete. And look at verse 3. Obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief. He was correcting them. He was rebuking them. You're doing all these things. But the truth is, you are in a spiritual slumber. But this also letter has Jesus' commendation or applause. Look at verse 4. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. Now that's quite interesting because many Bible scholars are saying hey, this is the only letter that doesn't have a commendation or applause from the Lord Jesus Christ. But I beg to differ because it seems like there is a tiny, tiny commendation mentioned because it says there that a few of them did not soil their clothes. So that means those are the few that, the, the few that are still committed, that are still faithful, that are still obedient to Him. They did not defile their garments. And look at the reward, look at the reward of those people. Look at verse 4. Yet you have few people in Sardis who have not sold their clothes. They will walk with me. Oh, I love that. Don't you love that, Bart? Can you imagine? They will walk with me. That's right. I mean, Jesus is not just going to observe them. You are going to be right next to Jesus, yes. walking down in heaven, on, traversing the universe, yes, walking you. with Him. Oh, but watch Lord. this now. They are able to walk with Him because they were dressed in white. Mm -hmm. That indication of Jesus made them holy. Yes, you cannot right. walk with Jesus unless you're holy. Come on, man. You right. cannot walk Let's with Jesus it. unless you're pure. You cannot walk with Jesus unless you're perfect. Say and it. He made them perfect. Yes, Thank you. Lord. But they were deserving of it? Absolutely. Because look at what it says. For they are worthy. Mm -hmm. They are worthy. So that means somehow these people remain faithful and diligent to the Lord Jesus Christ until the end. Until the end, they were not wishy-washy Christians. They were not Christians only on Sunday, but not Christian on a Monday. They're not only Christians, and they come to church, and they're all Christian-looking. Just like all of us right now. On, but then on Monday morning, they're horrible people. Come on now, come on now. And how many Christians are, are like that nowadays? Isn't it? They are all professing to be Christians, and then living together without marriage license. No. How, many, how many Christians out there are, are so materialistic and so greedy, and yet they are not giving to God? Hmm. Have you ever thought of that? I, I think in my opinion, and put this in parenthesis, this is just my personal opinion, okay? I think to purchase a $15,000 purse, I think to me that's sinful. Mm -hmm. I think that's sinful. To oh, give it to someone, even if it's your spouse, to purchase a $15,000 purse... And not give to the Lord? Come that on, is man. sinful. Especially if you're calling yourself a believer or a Christian. How many Christians out there are saying this? You know, they're making decisions without even praying for it. Hmm. They're making decisions that would concern their life without even checking it in the Word of God or looking it up or seeking God's Word first. Hmm. How many Christians out there professing to be Christians, but they would do everything to illegally, they would do everything illegally to cheat the IRS. Come on, man. Come on, or, or, in a smaller scale, how many Christians out there would do everything illegally not to pay their toll fees? Come on, man. And yet they love to drive on the toll, on the toll roads. Why? Because they're wider and nicer and bigger and there's hardly any traffic. That's but right. they would do everything not to pay the fee. How about this one? How many Christians out there professing to be Christians and they are at church regularly and yet their lives are full of enemies? Come on now. Come on now. Yes, yes. And what did Jesus say about that? Hmm. Look at Matthew 5, 23 and 24. Watch this. Jesus speaking here. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, hmm. leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. 
Did you see that? In other words, if you are coming to church and you are one of those that always inspired and always saying amen and, and you are always heartfelt and you are always crying and you are just excited to be in the church and you are saying praise you God, thank you Lord and outside your life do you have enemies that you have not reconciled with? Come you know what Jesus is thinking? I don't care how much you yell at church. I don't care how much you give at church. I don't care how much praying you do at church. I don't care if you listen to your pastor, it means nothing to me. It means nothing to me. Church, if you have enemies, if you have enemies, and I know you don't, you're, you're cat robbers. You won't do that, right? You won't. Because a, a person, a person who would practice their Christian life that way, wishy-washy, you know, a person who practices would not be an overcomer. Right, you're not going to be an overcomer. That's you're going right. to miss out on verse 5. Look at, look at the rewards of those who would overcome. Verse 5. He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. You get to be made holy and pure also. But not only that, I will never blot out his name from the book of life. You are saved forever. You have eternal life. You're going to be with Jesus forever and ever. But will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. At least Jesus is going to confess your name. Jesus is going to profess your name. Jesus is going to <laughs> declare your name before the Father yes. and His angels. Now think about that as, as if it's on a graduation day, a commencement exercise. Come on, man. Now remember the day that you graduate from high school or wherever you graduated from? Remember how you were walking on the stage or across the stage and the announcer is calling out your name? Remember the joy and the pride oh, that you yeah. have being yeah. called out and, and then all the people were cheering you and clapping their hands and applauding you and they were saying to you, congratulations, as yeah. you are being yeah. called out as you walk on the stage. Now think about that for a second. That's what's going to happen in heaven. Jesus is going to call out your name as you walk across the stage in heaven, but this time before the Father and His angels, but that certainly would be incomparably better than a regular graduation. But the letter to the church in Sardis ended with a challenge. The same challenge that He gave to all the other churches. Look at verse 6. Look at verse 6. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Do you know that He's telling us that today, right now? He's saying, listen with your spiritual ears. Listen with your heart. Don't ignore the message from me, from the Lord God. Pay attention. Don't take it for granted. Don't ignore it. Don't set it aside. Take it to heart. Why? Because if not, you may miss out on eternal life. He may, emphasis on may, he may blot your name out from the book of life. I don't know about you. I don't want the Lord Jesus Christ to be looking at the book of life and say, wait a second, Francis Kalimbahin. Oh my. Next. Irene Kalimbahin, good. Samantha, good. He imagine that. We have never thought of that, innit? We think we can just live our Christian life thinking we can be wishy-washy, do all the sinful things. We'll be fine. We don't have to come to church say every it, Sunday. We'll be say okay. Right. And as if the Lord Jesus would say, oh, I understand. I love you dearly. No. It's okay. Do all the bad things. Do all the bad things. It's okay. No. 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 He may not send his judgment right now. No. But here's the promise, or well, I would even say possibly a threat. Come on now, come on now. I will blot your name out from the book of life. That's right. I don't know about you, that would be the most terrifying yes, thing Lord. when we are there in heaven yes, and suddenly the Lord Jesus says, you don't belong here. Mm. Would that be? Yes, sir, yes, sir. I mean, if you don't come to church and, it, and, and, and you don't show up and you ignore, you know, some of my text messages. Or I'm fine with that. Well, what can I do? You know, unless you don't want to be here anymore, I can really block out your name from our membership book. But that's nothing compared to the book of life. The book of life. But notice here, in our closer look at this passage, Jesus reveals here the two signs of an alive but dead church. Like Sardis Church. 
And once again, we have to pay attention and think of our church as we look at the signs. Is Scat Rock Church a dead church? Let's look. The first one is this. Look at verse 1. An alive but dead church or a dead church is rich but no righteousness. Rich but no righteousness. Look at verse 1. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Yeah. Notice this. They have deeds. That's got to be good deeds. And they have a reputation, good reputation, of being alive, but you are dead. So that means the church in Sardis has a reputation of being alive and full of deeds. So that's clearly implied that the church in Sardis are doing all the right things. Don't you think so? Right. I mean, the church is growing. People are coming in droves. Bible study groups and Sunday school groups are well attended. They have events on their calendars. They have activities. And not only that, it says reputation. Yes, sir. That means within their community, they had a good reputation. That means they are well known. Perhaps they are good in community outreach. Maybe they are good in being a generous giver to any city projects. So they were known. And you would think, right? You would think. You would think, that's got to be an alive church. Don't you think? Those are all the indications of being an alive church. Can you imagine doing all these good deeds? And at the same time, at the same time, they were popular or famous in their community. But yet, in Jesus' autopsy, when Jesus performed his autopsy on the church, all he saw was, you are a dead church. You are a dead church in his examination. Why is that? Why? Because they may be rich on the outside, but they lack righteousness on the inside. Look at verse 3. Look at the command of the Lord Jesus Christ to them. He said, repent. 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 That means they may be rich with attenders. They may be rich with ministries. They may have nice buildings. They may be filled with programs and people. And they're popular in their community. And yet, there is no spiritual regeneration. Say that. Say that. Say that. Say that. There is no renewing from the Holy Spirit of God. That means a believer at the point or at the moment he receives the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit begins to work in that person's life. He begins to renew him. He begins to regenerate him. Because if without it, you cannot really call yourself a Christian. Look at what Paul said in Titus 3 verse 5. Titus 3 verse 5. He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy. Now watch this. By washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. In other words, if you are a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and have truly repented, there's going to be a life transformation. There's going to be a lifestyle change. There's going to be a change in your behavior and in your attitude. You cannot maintain, I am a Christian and yet no serving. I am a Christian and yet no giving. I am a Christian and yet no tithing. I am a Christian but yet no commitment. You are still the same. You're still dishonest at, at work. You still cheat. You, you still do all these vices and gambling and drinking. And you still could not miss your happy hour. Come on now. Come on now. It is impossible when the Holy Spirit of God dwells in you and yet there is no life transformation. And many Christians are like that, or professing to be Christians. They're church goers. They probably go to church. Why? Because they're supposed to, or because they want to be entertained. You know, churches nowadays have become like going to a concert. Many churches, you go to a church and they're like so entertaining. Like there's always festivities happening, right? Or perhaps they go to church because they want their ears to be tickled. Ain't happening in Cap Rock. Come on now. Come on now. Or perhaps they come to church because they want to have a warm, fuzzy feeling. You know, they want to make, I mean, one day they want to feel good on the inside. You know, many Christians, and how many churches and Christians are like that, like Sardis? They are spiritually rich on the outside, and yet no righteousness, no true repentance. Like this church goer, this church Christian who wrote a letter to the editor of the local newspaper. And here's what he wrote. Pay attention, pay attention. He writes, I've gone to church for 30 years now. 
In that time, I have heard something like 3,000 sermons. But for the life of me, I cannot remember a single one of them. So I think I'm wasting my time, and the pastors are wasting their time. See, that's an example of a churchgoer attending church, perhaps because they're supposed to, and yet the church is not transforming Say their that. lives. Say that. Guess what? That letter created a stir in the community. You know, it, it brought some controversy. And of course, to the delight of the editor, because now he's got to have more readers. Right? So other Christians wrote letters to them, or to the editors, and saying the same thing. Until, until one Christian wrote this to the editor, and that ended the controversy. Listen to what he wrote. Listen. Listen. I've been married for 30 years now. In that time, my wife has cooked some 32,000 meals. But for the life of me, I cannot recall the entire menu for a single one of those meals. But I do know this. They all nourished me and gave me strength I needed to do my work. If my wife had not given me these meals, I would be physically dead today. Likewise, if I have not gone to church for nourishment, I would be spiritually dead today. That's an example of a Christian who has true righteousness and renewing and regeneration from the Holy Spirit of God who comes to church because he wants his life to be renewed and to be say changed it, and to be transformed. It. And if God through Caprock Church is not transforming your life, hear me out, and if God through Caprock Church is not transforming your life, it's either our church is dead or you are spiritually dead. Come on, man. Come on, man. That's right. Come on, man. That's right. I'm just going to be blunt. I'll say it. Right. If God is not changing you through Cap Rock Church, then our church is dead. That's right. Mm -hmm. Or you are spiritually dead. Mm -hmm. The second sign of a church that's alive but dead is this. Has reputation but no reality. Has reputation but no reality. Once again, the church in Sardis may look very alive because they were known in the community. Once again, because they were doing deeds. They were doing great things in the community. And yet, God calls them a dead church. In other words, in reality, they were actually dead. Why? Because they lack doing great things for God. There's a big difference, isn't it? There's a big difference of doing great things in the community, even they are perfect and nice, versus doing great things for God. Now look at verse 2 and 3, or verses 1 and 2. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains, and it's about to die, for I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of of my God. Imagine that. In spite of their good reputation of, me, of having a vibrant church, an active church, active in the community, and yet Jesus' judgment to the church in Sardis was, you are a dead church. But why? But why? How could that be? They were doing great things. You know, they were collecting new packages of underwears. They're giving it to the local shelters. Come on, man. Come you know, on, they're man. going to homeless people and feeding them. What's wrong with those? But the question is this. It's not those that they do for other people. It's those great things they do for God. Amen. Amen. Were they doing great things for God? Look at verse 2. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. I have found, or I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Mm. Now you would think, wait a second, what, what's incomplete there? The church was alive, it's, it's booming with people, it's bustling with people. And they're helping in the community. They're active in the community. They're, they're famous and popular in the community. And yet Jesus says, what you're doing is not complete in the sight of God. Now, it's important then, it's important, so we can fully understand this, is to understand what that word means, complete. That word complete came from the Greek word pleroo, which literally means to be full or to be filled. Say that. Say now, think about that for a second. 
Suddenly, they are doing all these great things for the community and for the members and attenders and guests or and outsiders of their church, and yet they are not full or filled with God. Say it, say it. You me here? Yes, sir. Perhaps they're just doing it as a chore to maintain their reputation. Perhaps they're just doing it because it's the right thing to do, and yet they are not filled with God. Same thing as you being at church every single Sunday.